Welcome back to the course on English Varieties. Today's talk is about American English, which is seen as one of the most influential English dialects in the world. When I say that American English is the influential dialect nowadays, I mean two things. First, American English influences the learner's choice. That is, when a foreigner decides to begin studying English, they face a choice which English variety to learn. And as a rule, it's either standard British English or American English. Now more and more students shift towards American English, as they like the sound of it, they hear it more often thanks to films and social networks, or simply because they think that they look cool when they speak American English. Second, American English has a vivid impact on virtually every other English dialect around the English-speaking world. For example, a younger generation of Brits now pronounce the word schedule in the American way, schedule. And you will see such changes everywhere, not only in the level of phonology, but vocabulary as well. So, what is American English in reality? Using the terms of this course, American English is a regional variety, a regional dialect. However, as it is the case with British English, American English is a mosaic of smaller regional and social dialects. But how can one further divide American English? How many American Englishes are there? Is it possible to single out one variety that can be considered the purest example of American English? Let's find out. You already know that there is hardly anything discrete in the language. All the varieties of speech merge into one continuum and vary greatly depending on each speaker and even the context of communication. The latter imposes stylistic and pragmatic restrictions that shape the speech of a language user. Apparently, American English is not a homogeneous variety. It can be subdivided into several dialects and accents. Some of them are regional, others are social. Since it's difficult for the scholars to agree what American English truly is, then it is hard to pinpoint its location. Of course, one can argue that American English must be spoken in America. And that will be partly right, because the history of American English went along with the process of colonization of the American continent. The permanent English settlement in North America appeared in 1607. Later, in 1620, the first group of Puritans arrived on Mayflower. They didn't want to return to England as they searched for a new land, where they could exercise the freedom of religion. Later, more ships arrived, bringing with them people from different parts of England, Ireland and Scotland. And by the time independence was gained in 1776, about 2.5 million people lived in original 13 states. Now the USA is a big and diverse country. Its population is estimated at more than 300 million people, and it is still growing. Such a big country formed by different groups of immigrants cannot have just one uniform language variety. Therefore, English spoken in its territory, as I've mentioned before, is divided into several dialects and accents. A few linguists use the criterion of ethnicity to classify some of them, and that's why we can identify African-American vernacular English and Spanglish, for example. Others would divide the dialects in terms of the territory where they are spread. Hence, you have Northeastern American English, Southern American English, Canadian English, and other varieties. Thus, American English is an umbrella term that embodies a number of dialects and accents spoken across America. Apart from social and regional dialects, one can distinguish a regionally neutral dialect, which is called General American. While some scholars consider General American a standard variety for the whole nation, others regard it as an artificially created version of American English. Well, we should bear in mind that all standards are more or less artificial. Nevertheless, General American is mostly heard on television and radio, and hence sometimes is referred to as network English. General American accent has a number of specific phonological properties that distinguish this accent from those spoken in New England and in the deep south of the country. 
and since it is spread on a very large territory, it does not reveal the exact birthplace of its speaker. Therefore, it is referred to as regionally neutral. However, as RP, which is considered to be regionally neutral for Britain, is still associated with the Southern English varieties, scholars tried to localize General American as well. Here I should mention William Laboff, who tried to pinpoint General American in his series of telephone surveys. He found out that the closest regional variety to General American is located in the northern states of the country, between Minnesota and Michigan. Thus, one can cautiously talk about the origin of General American. This dialect is characterized by a number of conservative phonological features, which I'd like to discuss in great detail. First of all, General American is rhotic. That means that the sonoran tura is realized as a postal villa approximant and is pronounced in every position. Another salient feature of General American is T voicing. Normally, the sound T is realized in intervocalic position as a brief voiced flap when it follows a stressed vowel. You can hear it is in both within a word and also across word boundaries. For example, heating and I hate it, which are not pronounced as heating and hate it. This is also true if the sonoran tr intervenes, for example, party instead of party, and before syllabic l, r, for example, metal, traitor, instead of metal, traitor. Note that in general American, T voicing typically leads to neutralization of the contrast t, d, so heating, heeding, and heat it, and heed it sound the same. A further feature is that most Americans have yacht dropping following dental and alveolar consonants, for example, studio, nude, duke, instead of studio, nude, duke. Some American speakers have the dark l in all contexts. These features concern consonants. Even though they are quite noticeable, they do not constitute all the salient features peculiar for general American accent. Let's consider some of the features that concern vowel sounds. Since American English is rhotic, this feature influences greatly the system of diphthongs. The vowels before have a special quality known as r coloring. You can hear it when I read the following words. Fur, bird, nerd, chair, pure, here, in the last three words, you can expect the so-called central diphthongs, ear, ear, ear. However, in American English, because of the high degree of roticity, you will hear something different. Chair, pure, hear. The glide of the diphthong, the schwa element, merges with the consonant r. And that is why American English lacks central diphthongs. In general American, there is no trap bath split. Both words are pronounced with the same vowel e, as in bath, laugh, chance, ask, instead of bath, laugh, chance, ask. The exception to this rule concerns the loan words spelled with the letter A, for example, pasta, macho. General American also has two more vowel merges that characterize a broad variant of the American accent. Most Americans do not differentiate the vowels in the words like lot and palm, pronouncing them with the long r, lot, palm, so they sound the same. That is why when English speakers around the world are asked to imitate an American accent, they pronounce the phrase oh my god with a stereotypically more open vowel in the last word, oh my god. However, a sizable minority of American speakers, for example citizens of New York and other eastern areas, differentiate the vowels that occur in words lot and palm. They have two different vowels, the long O and the long R, depending largely on the consonant that follows, before such consonants as G, N, S, Th, F. There is a thought vowel, so that means long O, log, song, lost, 
Elsewhere, the palm vowel, that is, the long R, is used. Tarp, job, shark. This type of patterning is particularly common not only in New York, but elsewhere in high-frequency items, such as dog, wrong, cost, off, that are pronounced with the long O vowel. And finally, about half of Americans do not see the difference between the words court and court, thus lacking two vowels, short O and long O, all together, and pronouncing the mentioned words with the long A. Cut. The geographic area affected by this merger is quite large and is spreading from centers such as eastern New England and western Pennsylvania to encompass a vast portion of the American West. It is becoming so commonplace that it may soon be considered part of the mainstream English or general American rather than a regional variation. As you see, not all the features that I've mentioned above can be present in the speech of an ordinary American. However, there are a couple of salient ones that can help you identify the native speaker as an American. First of all, it's a high degree of reticity. The phoneum R is always pronounced after the vowels. And it leads to the reduction of the diphthong system, because American English, as you know, lacks central diphthongs. Next, the duck elephone of the phoneme L is used everywhere. And finally, the phonemes T and D are realized as an alveolar flap in the intervocalic position. So, that was the brief characterization of the phonology of American English. But you may rest assured that American English has its share of vocabulary and grammar features. However, I dare hope that you know the basic ones. That is why I would like to move on to the next point of my lecture that concerns ethnicity-based variety. Evidently, another social characteristic that can have a big impact on the type of dialect we speak is ethnicity. Here I'd like to emphasize that ethnicity-based patterns of variation have nothing to do with biology. Just as a child of French descent who is raised in Japan by Japanese-speaking caregivers will speak Japanese rather than French, so, too, a child of African-American descent, raised in a white family, in a primarily white neighborhood, will speak a white rather than African-American variety. Conversely, a white child raised by speakers of African-American English and surrounded by African-American English-speaking friends will speak this variety rather than a white dialect. Hence, similar to gender-based patterns of variation, ethnicity-based language differences are due to cultural rather than biological factors. The ethnicity-based variety that has been most thoroughly studied is the variety often referred to as African-American vernacular English or African-American English. You may also hear the terms Ebonics or Black English. Much of the early development of this language variety took place in the American South, so it shares many features with Southern white varieties. However, these shared features may be used to a greater or lesser extent in African American English than in white varieties, or they may pattern in different ways. For example, African American vernacular English and Southern white dialects share phonological features like low degree of reticity and the pronunciation of the I diphthong as a monophthong R, for example, non for nine and rod for ride. However, the low degree of reticity is found to a greater extent in African American English than Southern white varieties. In addition, I monophthongization in southern varieties occurs before both voiced and voiceless consonants, as in rod and right, for ride and right. In African American English, however, R for I occurs only solely before voiced consonants, so that speakers of African American English will say rod for ride, but right for right. Another phonological feature concerns the pronunciation of the cluster NG at the end of words. General American retains the consonant N, while African American English speakers utilize the nasal sonorant N in words like writing, that means writing. 
A further phonological phenomenon characteristic of African American English is TH replacement. For example, think for think and this for this. Some of the distinguishing morphosyntactic features of African American English include special rules for using copula B. However, we've discussed this feature in one of our seminars. That's why I'm not going to dwell on this longer. Perhaps I should spend more time discussing the point concerning cultural peculiarities. You know that while comparing regional dialects, linguists usually distinguish phonological, lexical and grammatical features that set dialects apart. However, when the two ethnicity-based varieties of one and the same language are compared, it is necessary to bear in mind cultural differences as well. To illustrate this point, I'd like to refer to the example described by Deborah Tannen, an American linguist. She writes about an episode that shows that most American whites tend to regard verbal aggressiveness as threatening, whereas many blacks value it as a sign of engagement. The episode she describes is a conversation at a confrontational meeting that took place between university faculty and community representatives. At one point, a black male faculty member pointed a finger at a white female colleague and angrily accused, Professor so-and-so, you need to know something. You can't make me over into your image. Do you understand that? You can't make me over into your image. When he saw that the woman appeared frightened, he assured her, you don't need to worry, I'm still talking. When I stop talking, then you might need to worry. When the meeting was over, she accused the black faculty member of having threatened her. However, he was astonished by her accusation. His comment afterwards was, all I did was to talk to her. Now how can that be threatening? Deborah Tannen explains that whites tend to regard fighting as having begun as soon as violence seems imminent. An impression they may get from the intensity of anger expressed verbally and the use of insults. In contrast, blacks do not deem a fight to have begun until someone makes a provocative movement. As a result, whites may try to prevent a fight by curtailing verbal disputes, whereas blacks conceive the danger of violence as greater when people are not communicating with each other rather than when they are, no matter how loud, angry or abusive their arguments may become. So you can see that while dealing with ethnic varieties, one should always consider cultural peculiarities associated with various ethnic groups. Partly because of these cultural differences, African-American vernacular English has long been embroiled in various controversies. In particular, this variety has long been looked down on in educational and other institutional settings, and its speakers are often still discriminated against. Although sociolinguists have been working for decades to convey their scientific knowledge about the regular patterning of dialects to the general public, incidents of discrimination illustrate that we still have quite a long way to go to eliminate dialect discrimination, as well as the racial prejudices that often underlie discrimination on the basis of language and language variety. That is why I would like to talk about some of the myths spread in the States that constitute certain prejudice and give ground to stigmatization. According to a popular belief, Americans think that some regional varieties of American English are more standard than the others. Moreover, they tend to claim that the regional varieties spoken in the South and in New York City are incorrect and far from the standard. Such a myth is supported by many in the USA, despite the numerous attempts of sociolinguists to destroy it. Dennis Preston, an American linguist whom you should know for his work on linguistic insecurity, has conducted a number of quantitative studies in the field of perceptual dialectology in order to learn how non-linguists perceive variation in language. Briefly, hundreds of speakers from different US regions were given maps similar to the one you can see in front of you right now and they were asked to identify various dialect areas in the country and rate the correctness and pleasantness of the varieties spoken there. The responses demonstrated the lowest ratings for the South and New York City, whereas the North 
was ranked as the region where the most correct language variety is spoken. A curious fact is that different areas of the USA show different levels of linguistic insecurity. Michigan, for example, is the most linguistically secure state in the country, because during the ratings the Michiganders think pretty well of themselves. They give their home state a ranking in the 8 range, the only area so rewarded. This is partly explained by the fact that Michiganders believe that they speak no dialect at all, and their speech is the purest sample of American English, which is of course not true. In general, Michiganders consider their speech the best and steadily assign lower ratings to the farther south a state is. The exception is New York City and nearby New Jersey that receive the scores in the 3 range, the only area in the north with such a low ranking. Completing the same tasks, southerners demonstrate high levels of linguistic insecurity. For example, respondents from the southeastern states ranked their home states somewhere in the middle, whereas other southern states like Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas received even lower scores. Maryland and the national capital Washington, D.C. received the highest scores from the southerners. Interestingly, when they were asked about the pleasantness of the state's varieties, the residents of Alabama, the southern states, demonstrated that they find their own accent the most pleasant one, and the farther north a state is, the less pleasant the accent is for the Alabamians. American English should not be associated only with one country, the United States of America. There is one more English-speaking country on the continent that is worth mentioning. Canadians claim that their country is just a nicer version of the United States of America. Does it apply to their dialect as well? The population of Canada is estimated to be over 35 million people, but slightly over 55% of Canadians claim English to be their native language. A sizable minority of speakers in Quebec province speak French as their mother tongue, and the majority of immigrants speak English as a second or foreign language. So Canadian English may be regarded as a continuum of varieties that represent the country's diversity. There are few studies of Quebec English and even fewer research works on the varieties spoken by naturalized Canadians. So that's why I'm going to talk mainly about the variety of Canadian English spoken by those who claim that English is their first language. In terms of its phonology, Canadian English is often classified together with American English as a North American English. This fact emphasizes that the typical accents of the two countries are almost impossible to distinguish by sound alone. Like most American Englishes, Canadian variety is age-pronouncing, rhotic, and has T-voicing. Yacht dropping is variable, but generally less prevalent in Canada than in the USA. Both words have the trap vowel, and the lot and palm vowels are merged, both sounding like palm. Perhaps the most salient feature of Canadian English is called Canadian raising and involves diphthongs I and AU, the first element of which is raised and becomes more centralized before voiceless consonants. Therefore, it is true for the words prize and cloud, but not for prize and cloud. The former are pronounced more like praise and cloud. Through raising, the initial element of the diphthong I and AU may shift to the schwa element. As a result, in the USA there is a stereotype to pronounce the sound about as a boot to exaggerate Canadian pronunciation. In terms of vocabulary, Canadian English follows the American model in many cases, preferring apartment to flat or elevator to lift. However, Canadians display a small set of their own unique vocabulary. Most of these words described Canadian flora and fauna and aspects of Canadian indigenous cultures, like the buffalo jump. There are few true Canadianisms, words that Canadians use for something that has other names in the other English dialects. For example, a machine that performs banking services is a bank machine in Canada, whereas it is an ATM in the States. 
As for the grammatical features, Canadians are known for the use of the invariant tag a attached to the end of the sentence to form a tag question. For example, you are from Canada, eh? For you are from Canada, aren't you? However, recent research suggests that at least among young Canadians, actual use of a eh is much less frequent than its popularity as the stereotype would suggest. To conclude, American English is accepted as a language model for many English learners. However, American English is a rather vague term that embodies several varieties of its own. When compared with British English, general American is often used as a reference, even though there is a lot of controversy around this notion as well. Nevertheless, I've tried to highlight several differences between American and British dialects. You should bear in mind that they exist at all the levels – phonology, vocabulary, and grammar. These differences have been accumulated for several centuries and were supported by the ideas of national identity arisen after the war for independence. American English can be subdivided into several regional and social dialects. Social dialects of American English can be further classified using the criterion of ethnicity. Some regional and social American English varieties acquire much praise, while others are seen as incorrect or ridiculous. Thus, dialect discrimination may still take place. I hope that this course has shown that any dialect is regularly patterned and therefore is neither worse nor better than the standard version of the language, which is just a version, that is, just a dialect itself.